Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Ivonis, for the beautiful song. Many of us were here on the 1st of January or the 31st, New Year's Eve, and we, we ended the year and started 2018 with the Lord. Amen? Amen? Thank you all for coming. I was truly blessed by your presence, but also the testimonies and the praises that we, we had on that night. After that night, I was convicted that 2018 is to be another year. Not a simple year, but a year of aggressive evangelism. You know why? Some of you may think because of Maranatha 18, but no. I just realized that Every single minute count. We talk about us being living or living in the, in, the, you know, in the last days and that Christ is coming soon. I understood that every opportunity that God gives us, we should seize it and do something about it. And that's why I decided not to let any opportunity go by. And I pray that that is also your, your goal for 2018. Every week counts because this might be my last message. Who knows? So every time we, we get that opportunity to preach the gospel, we need to make it count. Amen? And so... What I started doing after that first night, I decided to resume my media ministry, and um, I talked to my wife if we could also record for Japanese people, and thank God um, we were able to record one, and we want to share as much as we can with the people around us. But this is not only for Okinawa people, but also for people around the world. My French um, friends, uh, French-speaking friends, they asked me if I could also make some videos in French. And I told them, um, I'm going to work on it. It's not easy, but we will get there. And so they are saying, we are waiting, we're waiting. I say, yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. So many things to, to share, many things to, to tell people. And so when you think about all that, you know that you don't have enough time. And just working on those videos this week, I realized that I can be doing that and also preparing for, you know, for, for Sabbath and doing other things. It's, it's very tough, but it's better I get busy doing God's work than doing something else, right? And so the Lord has blessed us and has given us that opportunity to do it. I'm not, I might not be um, a good speaker like Doug Batchelor or C.D. Brooks, but it's not about how you do it. It's the message, the content that is important, and I believe that the Lord will use that to bless others. Amen? Amen. And so how can you be a blessing to people this year? You might not be able to preach, but you can do something, right? You can share those messages. You can text somebody. You can re record a voice message and send to a friend and share those good news with the people around you. Turn to the person sitting next to you. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, it's time to store up. It's time to store up. 2018 is going to be a year of aggressive evangelism. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are now ready to listen to you. Speak to us. And may we see you and only you. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 41. Genesis, chapter 41. And we'll be reading from verse number 1. A few weeks ago, we talked about the experience of Joseph in prison with two of Pharaoh's officials. Do you remember that um, sermon? Yes, the butler was restored, but the baker was beheaded. Now, the story continues from verse number 1. It says, Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. The meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh arose. That's the first dream. But it didn't stop there. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them, and the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Have you ever had a dream that you couldn't understand? In the Bible, in the Old Testament, God has been troubling kings with dreams. And every time, they never understood what the dream was all about. However, he was revealing to them important upcoming events that will actually shape and change the course of life. Do not take lightly the dreams you have at night. I'm not talking about those nightmares you have after eating so heavily at night. But dreams are not to be taken lightly. I've, I've had, you know, um, some interesting dreams where God told me what was going on. And my wife had dreams um, recently, and I'm still praying and asking God what those dreams are all about. So dreams can be used by God, and God has used it in the past to talk to his children. I do believe that he still does. Pharaoh had two dreams, and he had a rough night. Two dreams, one after the other. Did he understand it? Yes or no? No, he didn't. What did the king do? Verse 8 tells us what he did. Verse 8 says, Now it came to pass that in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Friends, only God can interpret the future. And he can only do it, he's the only one who can do it accurately because he is not limited by time. He lives in the future, he lives in the present. He was, he is, and will always be. That's God. And that's why he's the only one who can tell us what's about to happen. As long as we are connected to God. Friends, the future should not, must not take us by surprise. Are we together? If we are connected with God, there's no way we will not know what's coming. I'm not talking about when you're going to die. That you don't know. But you know exactly what will be the event coming in the near future. That's why we Adventists, we've been so blessed with this prophetic gift that the Lord has blessed us with. Unfortunately, not many people like it 
to be preached on the pulpit nowadays. We despise the gift, we despise the spirit of prophecy, and we despise what the Lord is telling us in those books. Mercy on us. The butler remembered, finally, his fault because he promised Joseph that as, as soon as he gets to the king, he will remember Joseph and he will plead for him before the king. So what did he do? He forgot. That's what happens every time when things go right. We tend to forget our friends. We tend to forget the promises we've given. And so, after this dream, then the butler remembered that, oh, there was somebody who interpreted my dream, and it came true. That's Joseph. He's still in the dungeon. So he told the king about Joseph's gifts and how his prediction were accurate. You see, every opportunity taken today, friends, Every opportunity taken today opens multiple doors now and in the future. You never know how one thing that you have done today or the opportunity you have taken today can actually open doors for you in the future. I was talking to a friend um, this past, um, on Tuesday, Tuesday evening, and she was telling me that she helped someone at work and now she's looking for a job, and that person is now helping her get the job. Now imagine if she didn't help that person, then those doors will be closed. The same thing with spreading the gospel. Every time you get an opportunity to tell somebody about God, and you fail to do that, you know what is happening? You are closing doors for God to work upon people's hearts. So take those opportunities just like Joseph took it. And today, and at that time, now his door was being opened. Let's skip to verse 14. Same chapter, verse 14. It says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to, to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. I thank God because Joseph did not take credit for it. Many times when we start doing things, God is blessing us to do things, we start taking credit for it. No, it's okay. No, um, don't worry about it. You're welcome. As if you got the gift you know, on your own. No, we need to give praise to God when it's due to him. Pharaoh then went on and told the dreams to Joseph. After listening to the dreams... The Holy Spirit revealed the meaning of this dream to Joseph, who then confidently told the king the following. Listen to what he told the king. Then Joseph, verses 25, he says, Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are at seven years, the dreams are one. And then, and the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blotted the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, Seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following. For it will be very severe, 
and the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, you know the story now. How did Joseph know that those two dreams were in fact one? You say the Lord told him. But remember, Joseph also had two dreams. Do you remember? He had two dreams while he was still with his father and his brothers. The first dream, he saw sheaves, right? Bowing to his own sheaf. The second dream, he had 11 stars and the sun and the moon bowing to him. I believe he understood that those two dreams are one dream. But when he told the dream to his brothers and to his father, how did they react? They? They called him, you know, the dreamer. They laughed, they mocked him, and actually despised him because of his gift. Even his father, said, he mocked him and said, are you saying that me, your mom, and your brothers are going to bow to you? But the Bible says, after he has said that, He did keep it in his mind. His brothers despised him. They despised his gift. And they they found a way to kick him out because of, well, jealousy. And also, they didn't like him for who he was. Do you understand why many of us in the church today We despise the gift of our sister Ellen White. They took it as a joke. A lot of us take it as a joke. That these prophecies are a joke. I don't know if I will be there to tell you when those prophecies come true. That I've told you so. I don't want to be the one telling you that. If you're not taking seriously what the Lord has revealed to us as a church, as a people, to reach out to the world, then time will come when those things will happen that you will look back and say, well, I despise it. Now it's too late. Seven cows. Seven fat cows, which basically means seven years of plenty. Think about that. And then seven thin cows, or skinny cows, meaning seven years of great famine. Now what? What do we do with the meaning Okay, pastor, I got it. I know the prophecy will be fulfilled. The Sunday law will be enforced in a few years. Then persecution will be on the saints. Yes, I got it. Thank you. See you next Sabbath. Amen. Friends, Pharaoh understood now the dream. Seven years of plenty... Seven years of great famine. Now he knows it. What do you do now with the interpretation? You prepare. That prophecy was not given to Pharaoh just as an information. It was not for information's sake that God revealed that dream to Pharaoh. No. It was for him to be prepared. The same thing happens to us today. The prophecies in the Bible and also in the spirit of prophecy are not for us to just know, yes, they will happen. No, they were given to us so that we can And so we watch the news. We read articles. We, we see the things happening in, in the U.S. and around the world. 
climate changing. And we say, well, things are getting crazy in the world, huh? Yeah, that happened. And what do we do? We continue life as usual. Friends, we don't do anything about what we know. And we understand that, yes, these are signs of the time. Yet, we don't get ready. And so I ask the question, is it because we are just pretending or we just don't believe it? Because it's one thing to know what's going to happen. It's another thing not to do anything about it. Brother Cedric was saying that we need to get our things in order. And he's right. But he has said that a week ago. I wonder how many people took that counsel and did something about it. We wake up every morning and we think, Life you go as it did following the, the previous night or the previous day. We think we'll be here next week. We think we'll be here next month. We think we'll be here in 2019. Who told you that? We don't know, friends. Preparation is not to be taken lightly. Pharaoh was given the interpretation of his dream. What did Joseph tell the king? And I like that because God did not just reveal the, you know, the future to, to, to Pharaoh for him not to do anything. God also told Joseph what the king should do. Verse 33, same chapter, verse 33 says, Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. I think something is missing there. The authority of Pharaoh. And he continues and says, and, and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So Joseph told Pharaoh to do what? To store up for the seven years of famine. Store up during the seven years of plenty. Because when the seven years of great famine come, it will be as severe that you will actually forget those seven years of plenty. That's how bad it was going to be. A time of crisis, a great tribulation is coming, friends. What should we be found doing today, SDA? John 9, verse 4, gives us the answer. John 9, verse 4. John 9, verse 4. It says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming. When no one can work, friends, we got to work the works of the one who sent us while it's still day. Because the night is coming when I will not be able to work. You will not be able to work. And we're talking about working for God. Joseph was taken from a prison house to the throne just like Jesus was sold as a slave, but now is sitting at the right hand of the Father on the throne. Do you see why it's important to understand the time in which we live? 2018 isn't a year to be taken lightly. 
Yes, 2017 is gone. And as long as these church doors are opened, friends, I want to do my very best to be here and store up. As long as we have spiritual messages on YouTube, on social media, I want to be there to listen to those, take notes, and store up. Why? Because we are living in the years of plenty. We are still in the years of plenty. You come to church every week. I see if church is a theater. You come, you sit, you have your popcorns, and you get entertained. Church is not a place to come to be entertained. Church is a place to store up and take notes. We come to study, friends. We come to dig in the Word of God. But seldom I see people taking notes during church service. Why? Because we are so smart, we'll remember everything the pastor said. Up. Because we have YouTube to go back and check it. I bet none of you do that. Remember those days where you see the old people in the pews with their big note, notepad and everything the pastor says, they'll be taking notes. And we are like, they're not smart enough. We got our phones. Instead of using those, we text during the sermon. You're on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram. Friends, you think I'm joking. You think this is not serious. You think I'm just exaggerating. Friends, if you're not storing up now, don't, don't think when the time comes, you will remember everything you once heard. It doesn't work that way. We take notes. We study what we learned. And we, we, we go over it again. And then we share it with others. Remember, if you're not taking advantage of this time, we are wasting the time of plenty. Soon, you'll look for those messages. You will look for those teachings. And you won't find them. Mark my words. We're here every week. And we are blessed. We get the chance to worship God without any problem. And we think we'll have this forever. My Bible tells me we just have just a few years more. Joseph was able to get to that prominence in Egypt because he overcame those bitter experiences he had in the past. His brothers selling him to, 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 to Egypt as a slave and um, him being put into prison because he refused to, to commit fornication with a harlot. Joseph drank all that bitter cup patiently for how many years? For about 13 years. He waited patiently for God's time. And as we wish each other Happy New Year, we need to also tell us, tell one another that the Lord is going to be with us. But we need to be ready to drink our bitter cup this 2018. Happy New, yes, yes, but not every day will be happy. Are you ready to face the bitter experiences this year? Because only when you finish drinking those things, then the Lord takes you to another level. Jesus drank his cup, and now he's sitting at the, next, at the right hand of his father. Joseph drank also his bitter cup, and he was now put on the throne next to Pharaoh. Don't be discouraged when family members forsake you during this year. Don't give up when church people, when church members gossip about you. It's fine. As long as you are in the Lord, don't worry about those things. Don't stop coming to church because people don't worship the way you like. Come to church. 
Don't stop ministering because no one cares. No one participates. It's not a joke to be a Christian today. Did you know that? To be a Christian in this world today is not a joke. It's tough. And in order for you to remain a Christian, you have to understand that Christianity is tough. Understand it, take it, and walk with the Lord. Sometimes we think because we're Christian, everything should be fine. That's not what the Lord promises us. He says, in this world, you shall have tribulation. But don't worry. I have overcome the world. Amen? When you feel like giving up this year, remember that Jesus drank that bitter cup since the beginning of sin in heaven. And how long has it been? A long time. And he's patient. Why? Because of you and me. Evangelism isn't going to be easy this year. Yes, we want to go out door to door, knock to people's doors, and speak and preach the gospel to them. It's not going to be easy. But we've got to thank God for the opportunity we have here in Japan to do evangelism. Amen? In Russia, I repeat, in Russia right now, it's a nightmare. Did you know that the extremists and even Pacific's Jehovah's Witnesses were banned from any religious activities in Russia? Watch this. Last year, April 22nd, 2017, in the news, this is Alitia, um website. It says, Pacific Jehovah's Witnesses now banned in Russia as extremists. Listen to the article. It says, the main issue, as I see, it lies in the fact that the Moscow Patriarchate, along with other branches of the Russian Orthodox Church, such as the Orthodox Church of America, as well as with the support of the Muslim clerics, sees such religious groups' activity in Russia as a threat. They actually do not see them as uh, pacifists. Because their methods are quite activist and perhaps, in the Russian view, extremist. Proselytizing is not a part of religious culture in Russia, and many Russians, as well as the government and the religious establishment, are suspicious of it. Jehovah's Witnesses are not the only ones affected, she said, The law applies also to Mormons and who? Seventh-day Adventists, for example. She said that the Orthodox in the south of Russia are generally very religious and see groups such as the Seventh-day Adventists as competition. There have been many examples of people from Christian sects going into Orthodox churches and distributing literature or in some way distributing church services, she said. They go, how? Door to door, and the Russian Orthodox Church sees them as aggressive because they talk to people very openly. They give out literature, then often say very negative things about the Russian Orthodox Church. They are very good at debating. Yes, we are, right? Right? Because when you take the Bible, we can debate. We're good at that. They are being perceived by a very conservative religion that is in the process of reshaping itself and has been doing so for 25 years after a very long time of atheism. They are being perceived as the guys coming in and taking away who? Our future converts. Friends, You may say, well, they can just find another way to evangelize in Russia. Stop going door to door and nobody would disturb you. Listen, it didn't stop there. Notice. Now, this is the Jehovah's Witnesses website, and this was written on December 25th, 2017, on Christmas Day. What is the title? Russian authorities sees Assembly Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia. 
You may ask why. Well, we talked about it a while ago. They were not, and you can see during the raid, the police man came into the hall. This is their hall, and they, they, they seized the hall. They took it from them. And this is what the, the, the article says. It says, the assembly hall is the largest property that Russian authorities have seized from the witnesses since the July 17, 2017 ruling of the appellate chamber of the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation. The Supreme Court ruling ordered the liquidation of all the witnesses' legal entities throughout Russia, the banning of their activity and the seizure of their properties. Jehovah's Witnesses consider the actions of the Russian government as gross religious intolerance, which has deprived them of not only religious freedom, but also their property, much of which was purchased and renovated by Russian citizens of little means. I read this, and I asked myself, why Jehovah's Witnesses? Why not Adventists? What do you think is the answer to that? Why Jehovah's Witnesses? Why not Seventh-day Adventists? Because we are no longer doing what we used to do. We're not aggressive in evangelism, probably because we're not going door to door anymore. It's a bad news, but we know it's coming. But then when I see this and I don't see my church, then I tell, it tells me that we're not doing what is right. Because if we are doing what the Lord has called us to do, we will be the first one that this will be happening to, not the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're more aggressive. But we have something better than they have. If only we knew what we have. Or maybe because we befriended the Orthodox. Who knows? Only God knows why we're not there. I don't want to speculate here. Do you see where we are at this point in time? This is happening in Russia. You may say, well, it will never happen in the States. Mark my word, it's coming. It's coming. Don't think life will continue to be as it is now. People are losing their properties. They are being forbidden to preach the gospel. Yet, we are here in the years of plenty and we are sleeping. If somebody is sleeping beside you, please wake him up. This is not a time to sleep. It's time to wake up and do something about our lives. 2017 was a painful year for many of us. But please, keep moving forward. Some of you have been suffering for many years. Sometimes you ask, how long will I continue to suffer like this? The Lord is telling you today, the glory is mine. My grace is sufficient to you. Keep moving. Keep going. Because God has promised us Something very, very beautiful. You know, Ellen White talks about when we get to heaven, some of us will try to look at all those trials we had on earth. And she says this in early writings, page 17, here we saw the tree of life and the throne of God. We try to call up our greatest trials, but they look so small compared with the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that surrounded us that we could not speak them out. And we were all cried out, Hallelujah! Heaven is cheap enough. And we touched our glorious harps and made heaven's arches ring. Friends, as we continue our journey with patience, endurance, prayer, and songs this year, 2018, let's remember that Christ has promised to give us what? His throne. 
And we read that in Revelation 3.20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, what would I do? I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The Lord is promising us this year that if you hold on to him, there is a crown to win at the end. But we are right now in the years of plenty. The years of famine are coming. What will you do in your years of plenty? That is your decision to make. Is there anyone today who wants to make a commitment with Jesus? Is there anyone who would like to say, Lord, thank you for another year of life? Thank you for the years of plenty you are allowing us to have in order to store up spiritual blessings, but also physical blessings. You know why it talks about preparing to live in the countryside. How many of us are making plans for those? It's not just spiritual blessings, but you also need to prepare. When time will come that you have to leave the cities, it's also preparations, friends. Is there anyone today who would like to say, help me take this work seriously and make the most of every opportunity you give me this year? Help me be patient. Help me endure. Help me improve my prayer life and help me to sing even when things are not right. Today, I think about life and I think about death. It's not something that anyone will like to face. But it is a reality in our world. I can count how many people died that I know last year. And I know that it's going to grow more and more this year and the years to come. Is there anyone today who would like to say, Lord, all I have is today tomorrow I don't know but today I want to give my life to you and every single day that you give me I will give that to you as well I want to store up store up for the crisis ahead and I want to use every opportunity you give me to bless something somebody with the things I've been storing up Bible studies in homes prayer meeting Sabbath school Sabbath worship afternoon programs those are your opportunities to store up every morning when you wake up your devotion time store up at night before you go to bed store up Throughout the day, read something that is beneficial to your spiritual life and also to the people around you. Don't take it lightly, friends. We don't grow spiritually as magic. We work for it. Whatever you put in here, it will reflect also in the way you live. Is there anyone today who would like to say, Lord, 
I want to make a step forward in faith and store up in these years of plenty. Stand where you are. You see, standing is never the only step we have to make. Why don't you make a step forward and come closer to me where I am right now? By making that step, you're saying, Lord, I'm committing myself to do more than I used to do. Amen. I want to store up because I know your word is true and the crisis will surely come. When it does come, I want to be ready. Just like Pharaoh was ready. Amen. Why don't you hold each other's hand as we pray? I want to help. Gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for 2017. And we thank you for this year that I just started. Your children are standing, holding hands because they understand that it's only through your grace that we are still living in the years of plenty. Help us, dear Father, to put aside anything that will hinder us to store up in these years. Father, every single day the devil is working. He's working with leaders, religious leaders and civil leaders to make plans to take away our freedom of religion. We don't know when that law we proclaim and enforced, but we know that every single day you give us is an opportunity for us to draw closer to you. Help us, dear Lord, to take seriously our devotion times. Help us to to take our prayer time seriously. That every single day, Lord, we will not just pray a two-minute, 30-second prayer, but we will spend more time in prayer. Oh, I see this year, we want to be a church that prays and prays and prays and, and prays. And we want everyone standing here who also devote their lives to prayer and evangelism. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, but never from your presence, that you would teach us to take you seriously this year and make our election sure, our calling sure, because we ask in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.